All right, let's go ahead and get this party started. Welcome, class, to your final Classics 160v1 Meet the Ancients class for this semester and for this academic year. I, of course, am your professor one more time, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to finally wrap things up. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a few student presentations, the ones that we uh, didn't get to last time, and then we'll spend the majority of our time today uh, kind of recapping what we've done in the second half of the course with the goal of making sure that everybody is really prepared for the exam on Wednesday. So let's go ahead and dive right in. No need to waste any time here. We're going to start with a few announcements. From there, we are going to uh, tackle those few uh, presentations that we didn't get to last time. This got scratched from today's. I was going to talk kind of about the legacy of Greece and Rome, and I think that is really, really important, and I hope that you guys have a sense for some of the things that we've talked about that still play an important role today, right? So things like democracy and republicanism and infrastructure and roads and all those wonderful things, right? Uh, but I also thought that you guys were probably a little bit more interested in going through the exam uh, review so that everybody can get fantastic grades when we do this thing on Wednesday. So let's go ahead and tackle a few announcements first. So first things first, uh, go ahead and put your screen into speaker view so you can see me, you can see the slides, you can see the other presenters when they present. Um, the big announcement of course is the exam for this class is going to be this Wednesday during class time, right? So instead of coming to Zoom, don't come to Zoom. I'm not gonna be on Zoom. Nobody's gonna be on Zoom. Instead of that, uh, go ahead and go straight to D2L and you will be able to access the exam starting at noon. It's 50 minutes long. Um, and uh, once you finish that thing, you are like good to go, right? You can go ahead Think about what other, other classes you have, what your other exams are, put studying into those, uh, and make sure that you succeed and um, really do a good job uh, on all the remaining things you have for all of your classes between now and the end of the semester. So that's the, that's the big announcement, really. Uh, what else do we have? Student course surveys. Uh, these are back. I think they didn't have these like last year. Maybe they had them in the fall. I don't know. Um, but they do have them again now. And uh, I would love for you guys to take a few minutes, um, either today or tomorrow. I think really today or tomorrow, I think you're running out of time on this. But if you haven't done it yet, these are hugely important for me. And for a couple reasons here. Um, so the first one being that learning to give useful feedback is a great skill to have, right? Um, like being able to give constructive, substantive feedback is a really useful thing. Uh, the second thing, hopefully you guys know by now, I take this really, really seriously, right? I really care uh, about teaching and uh, doing a good job teaching, teaching uh, in a way that conveys a lot of information, but also is fun and exciting um, and just enjoyable to be a part of. Um, and so anything you guys have in terms of how I can improve, that's always, always useful. Um, and then finally, right, uh, you know, even though I'm a lot older than you, I get grades too. <laughs> and um, so these student course surveys are one of the main ways in which I kind of get my grade from my boss uh, at the end of each year. So it ends up being really, really useful um, from my end. And uh, I just really, really appreciate it. So thank you for taking some of the time to do that. Uh, other announcements. Um, if you have loved this general education course and you want more awesome general education courses on the ancient world. We've got some exciting ones for you this summer. Uh, we've got one on classical mythology. Um, we've got one on sports in the ancient world, ancient athletics, and we've got one on the wild world of ancient Egypt, right? If like for the last 80% of this class, you've just been frustrated that we left Egypt way back in like week three. <laughs> like the Egypt one is for you. It's really, really cool. They're all online. They're all um, completely uh, a, um, asynchronous, right? So like, even if you've got other things going on this summer, it's very possible to, to do one of these things on top of it. Um, and if you have any questions, always feel free to, to shoot me an email. Um, and I'll, I'll help you out in whatever way I can, but 
there's some fun classes and I, I would love to work with any and all of you, whether it's over the summer or in the fall or any time during uh, the rest of your career here at the U of A. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive right into things um, with finishing up our, uh, our student presentations from last time. I believe where we left off... So Hassan, are you on here? Are you able to... Um, were you able to get your thing uploaded? Yes, I am. Okay, awesome. Let me go ahead and I'm going to make you a, uh, um, a co-host here so that you can share your screen. All right? All right, there we go. And you should have all the power now. Feel free to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your project. Show us a snippet of that. Um, and we're excited to see it. All right, so go ahead, get orange in there, and we are going to go ahead and zoom back now. That's where we want to be. Okay, so once you've got your attendance in there, let's start by talking about exam format here, all right? Um, so the format is going to be exactly the same as the, uh, the, the midterm, all right? So you've got 25 multiple choice questions. Somebody pointed out already that on the, the study guide, it says, um, it says, I think 40 questions or something like that. That is like an older version of the course. There are not 40 questions. Um, and uh, so just 25 questions and one essay, all right? 25 multiple choice, one essay. What I would suggest for you guys to do, um, as you work your way through the exam is try to stick to about the, the kind of divide here where you do about a minute per question on the multiple choice and you've got about 25 minutes for the essay, right? You're getting 50% of the exam from those multiple choice questions. You're getting 50% of your grade uh, from um, the, the essay. So try to sp split your time accordingly. Um, all right, some good questions in the chat here. Um, oh, Alexa, thank you so much for the... Uh, <laughs> Um, for uh, the, the kind note there. I remember you coming up in uh, Classical Mythology back when we had it in Social Science 100. Um, I can't believe that was like four years ago now. Uh, back in the days when we still got to teach in person. But I'm glad that you've enjoyed the classes and it's certainly been wonderful working with you. POTUS in 2024. Um, I'll consider it. Jorge, if, uh, if I do do that, I will uh, get in touch with you as campaign manager. Um, in terms of, yeah, essay length, if you can shoot for 250 to 500 words, you're in pretty good shape there, right? If you're at like, if you're at 50 to 100 words, um, it's not going to be, you know, undoable, but you're probably going to be a little bit on the short end there. And if you're at like 750 words, you're certainly going to be at like the longer end of things. But if you get into that 250 to 500 range, I think you're going to be pretty solid there. Um... And again, you, you should, what I would really, really uh, recommend is trying to um, outline some of these ahead of time so that, you know, you can kind of hit the ground running uh, when you, you get the essay. Did I try Celsius? <laughs> no, I got to try this. I got to try Celsius over the summer. And then, then I think email, I, like I can still email the whole class and I will, I will email you with like a video update of me trying Celsius. That's a great, a great point. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, you'll, you'll definitely get a report. Now let's see if we can get uh, the per Professor Ruby up here. Professor Ruby, come here, come on. Uh, she's currently under the desk. Um, and right before class, we had like kind of a freak out uh, because she, she brought like a giant lizard back into the house. <laughs> and uh, my colleague, my colleague and partner, Dr. Montgomery, uh, was running around the house saying, Rob, Rob, there's a lizard in the house. And I was like, I'm about to teach. And now, now Ruby's just laying on the ground. Ruby, come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come up here. Come here. Come on. <laughs> it, We'll work on it. We're, we're going to work on trying to get her up 
Uh, she seems to be enjoying laying down right now, so we'll, we'll work on that. Um, all right. So any kind of questions um, in terms of format, in terms of logistics, kind of not so much content-based questions, but just in terms of the way this thing works? Try to speak now or forever hold your peace on this one. Ruby, come on. Come on. All right, well, more dog. <laughs> no questions about the exam, lots of questions about the dog. Um, okay, come here, Ruby, come on. Let's get you up here. Come on. Everybody wants to see you. There we go. There we go. All right. Now we're now we're teaching. <laughs> Ruby, you can see yourself over there. Say hi to the students. Hi. Hello, hello, students. It's been awesome working with you this semester. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, we will dive in. <laughs> Ruby, look at the look at the screen. Um, okay, let's go ahead and dive into the, the content here. Where are we? That's where we want to be. Okay. Yes, exam content. So we remember we began the second half of the course with the founding of Rome in the 8th century BC. And of course, right, our main characters involved here are Romulus and Remus. And this dog type character. See, Ruby, that's kind of like you. But it was actually not a dog, it's a wolf, right? And they were abandoned, sent down the river, and it was a she-wolf that suckled the children until they could be kind of old enough to go back, restore their grandfather to his rightful throne in Alba Longa, and then they go on to found the city of Rome. And then after a weird kind of thing, right, Romulus actually kills his brother, uh, who is trying to found a city on a different hill. Um, but that's how Rome gets started, and that is how we get the first of the seven kings of Rome, right? And we saw that early, early on, those seven kings uh, each kind of contributed something either to the character of the Roman people or the city of Rome itself, right? So Romulus becomes the warrior that everybody's based on. And Numa Pompilius becomes the pious guy who's devoted to the gods. And then other guys add things like the Circus Maximus and the port city of Ostia and the temple of Jupiter uh, Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill, right? All these very famous things that become fundamental to the city of Rome, a lot of those get started under the kings. But in our last king, right, um, we end up getting a guy who's so, so terrible because absolute power cover-ups absolutely, right, that the senators throw him out and they start the Republic, right? And what is the guiding ideology of the Republic? Can somebody throw that in the chat for me here? Ruby, is this, is this how my students watch lectures? All right, all right, we're letting her down here. Good job, good job. Um, yeah, Ruby, the, yes, no more kings, right? No kings in Rome. That power is to be shared, right? We're going to give power to the people, um, and they will elect their representatives to govern. And uh, then in addition to that, the people who do govern do so for a very limited amount of time, right? They share power and they, they rule for a limited amount of time. And the idea behind that is things can't get too bad. And we saw that even during the Republic, we still get some of these kind of mythical history, mythical historical type things, right? Uh, with people like um, Horatius Cocles, right? At the Sublician Bridge fighting off the Etruscans. And then we get Mucius Scaevola. That's who we see over here, right? Sticking his hand into the flame, telling the Etruscan king that like 300 Roman men have dedicated themselves to assassinating him. And of course we get Cincinnatus, right? The guy who's called to power and takes control of the Roman army, defeats the threat, and then goes back to being a farmer. But what, what we ended up seeing, right, was that this kind of power doesn't, this kind of... Like what I suggested? 
Oh, hang on, hang on. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Let me see if I can mute you guys. Not because I don't like you, of course. All right. Um, yeah, so what we end up getting is we get the expansion of Roman power across the Mediterranean, right? So that starts uh, with the Punic Wars, where Rome is doing battle with Carthage, right? And in a series of three wars, the first two of which are actually very, very competitive and could have gone either way, Rome's able to win. And it's these Punic Wars that take them from a power within, the Met within Italy, right? Within the Italian peninsula to the dominant power within the larger part of the Mediterranean, right? Um, and one of the, the problems that kind of comes with this, right, is all of a sudden the idea of kind of early Republican governance starts to fall apart because now you're not fighting like a like war that might take a month, you know, 50 miles away in Italy, right? You're taking a war that might take years, 500 miles away across the Mediterranean. And all of a sudden, the idea of, like, bringing your, like, generals back, right, your consuls back, putting in new consuls, having to have them take over the army, put in a whole new strategy, doesn't make a lot of sense. You need people to be in power for longer periods of time because they're so much farther away from Rome and they're engaged in these conflicts that last longer and longer periods of time. And what that ends up doing is all of a sudden, individual people are starting to get more and more and more powerful. And so, for example, right, we get these two guys, we get the Gracchi. Now, they never actually end up being consuls, right? The Gracchi uh, are two tribunes of the plebs. But they're also at least somewhat power hungry, and they come up with a really interesting idea of like, let's just skip the Senate altogether and take things straight to the people. And this be, be, kind of starts a series of conflicts between the populares, right? The people who try to gain power and govern through the masses. And the optimates, right? The people who try to kind of gain power and govern through the senatorial aristocracy. And there's this battle that keeps going back and forth for the next hundred years, and it eventually erupts into civil war. And the first time we see that is between these weird looking fellows here, right? Uh, we've got Gaius Marius and we've got Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And they are the first ones, right? The first Roman generals to take Roman armies and go to battle against other Romans. But they're not the last to do that. And we see that with the rise of Caesar, individuals are becoming more and more powerful, right? We've got Crassus, the richest dude in Rome. Caesar, right, like one of the most powerful, and Pompey, one of the best generals in the history of Rome. And Caesar goes off to Gaul, right, uh, and not only conquers that region, but then has to come back to Italy. He's accused of all these crimes, and instead of kind of going on trial for them, he takes his army with him and basically says, you want to put me on trial? How about we just go to battle instead? And he starts chasing all these senators all across the Roman world and winning every battle against them that he has. But he can't escape, right, uh, the ultimate fate that awaits him. And even though he's able to keep winning on the battlefield, he eventually is assassinated with the idea, right, with these kind of famous words, six semper tyrannis, right, in this way, right, this is going to happen to all tyrants because they saw him as somewhat of a, a re-emerging king here. But civil war doesn't end with the assassination, right? His two successors, Octavian, his adopted heir, and Mark Antony, his, his kind of favorite main general, they end up first teaming up to defeat the people who assassinated Caesar, and then going to battle with each other, right? And it's at the Battle of Actium that Octavian, the younger guy, right, is able to use his navy to defeat Mark Antony and reconsolidate power in terms of a single person, right, for the entire Roman world. And we saw, right, we talked quite a bit about Octavian, who becomes Augustus, and the strategies that he uses to consolidate all that power in a single person, right? Remember, we've had 500 years of the main idea being no kings in Rome, and now we've got a single person ruling all of Rome. But we saw that he's like really intelligent in the way that he does this, right? So first of all, he, he says, he like proclaims, 
he's restoring the Senate and the Republic, right? So rhetorically, he's saying things are just like they've always been, even though the Senate and the Republic gives all the power to Octavian. And then he does a bunch of propaganda type things, right? The Temple of Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger, the Autopacus or the Altar of Peace, uh, building his own forum. Um, there's, oh, the Reis Gestae, right? Where he writes down all his accomplishments. All these things are propaganda um, to kind of make this transition work smoothly. And then he combines all that with things that actually practically help the people, right? So like redoing a bunch of infrastructure, right? Rebuilding roads. Uh, improving the grain dole to actually give citizens of Rome kind of the benefits of this burgeoning empire. And for 200 years, we get something called the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, where by and large, right, the, they're still doing battle on the outskirts of this here, right, against these kind of barbarians around the outskirts. But the interior of this thing here, Rome is basically at peace, despite the fact that they get a bunch of crazy emperors, right? And we saw that one of the takeaway points is that as long as you're not going to civil war, the way that they had the empire organized, it was like robust enough to withstand a bunch of crazy emperors. But it doesn't last forever, right? And we saw that in the third century, uh, things start to kind of fall apart because this one, you know, originally very small bureaucracy like gets much, much bigger. Things become more expensive. Inflation is going rampant. They're debasing the currency. And eventually, right, there's all sorts of turnover in terms of the emperors as well, right? So we saw that with, with the story of Pupianus, right? Um, and then we get Diocletian trying to, to fix things by splitting up the empire and coming up with the succession plan and having people try to retire. And it works for basically one generation. And then we get Constantine, right? And Constantine moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople. Uh, he ends up um, not necessarily making Christianity the official religion, although that happens a few emperors later, right? But he says that Christians are now okay, right? They are legal within the Roman Empire. And this is kind of the start of a process that over the next couple hundred years, it really moves from being kind of a um, Roman Empire focused on traditional Roman religion to a different sort of empire, right? That's still called the Romans, right? But now focused uh, in large part on Christianity. And in large part, that's kind of why we, we bring our story of ancient Rome to an end around this time. Even though, right, we saw in that one lecture that depending on how you define this, you could say that Rome's still around today. Um, but the, the reason we kind of tend to end our story there is because the whole idea of what's going on changes, right? The whole focus changes uh, from kind of pagan Roman antiquity, where you have different philosophers and you've got, uh, you know, mythology and you've got art and architecture dedicated to the, the you know, traditional Roman gods, um, to Christianity, where now everything, right? Everything in terms of art, everything in terms of impressive monumental architecture, everything in terms of like literature, it's now all focused on Christianity. And that's why when we get to the Renaissance, right? And if you've heard of the Renaissance, right? It translates from the French as the rebirth. What that is, is it's people rediscovering kind of the ancient, uh, ancient philosophy, ancient literature, ancient art of Greece and Rome before Christianity kind of took over. And so you'll start seeing mythological uh, themes develop again in literature and in art, that sort of thing. It's the rebirth of the classics themselves. So uh, what, we've, what we've seen kind of in this class, right, is the, uh, the, the kind of start um, way, way back with these very early empires. The move through Greece, which goes from those empires, right, towards a period of democracy, and then comes back to an empire under Alexander the Great, and a similar thing happening with Rome, right? Where it starts with this period under kingship. It gets power dispersed during the Republic. And then it comes back to kingship under the emperors. Um, and along the way, we've seen the developments of all sorts of things in terms of architecture and literature and infrastructure and, uh, you know, societal attributes like law. Um, all of these things. Uh, of course, politics that still influenced us today. So thank you so, so much, entire class, for joining me this semester. I have had an absolutely 
Uh, awesome time working with you. Um, the last thing I would like to say is if you guys need anything moving forward, right? Whether it's uh, letters of recommendation, advice on classes, whether you want to do a little bit more in the world of classics and, you know, look at a classics minor or something like that, shoot me an email. I am here for you. Um, whether you are a, a classics major or minor or just, you know, had a lot of fun in this class. Um, I know it's a huge university, but uh, I'm here for you guys. I've loved working with you. And I, uh, I very much look forward to future collaborations. So good luck on the exam. Um, and I will uh, be in touch with you over the summer uh, once I get that Celsius drink. <laughs> and um, I've just had a real, real enjoyable time working with you this semester. So enjoy the summer. You guys have earned it. Good luck on the exam. And we will be in touch again soon.